I don't think it's ever a good idea to compare yourself to others because it just leads to desperation and low self-esteem. But I think it's a fantastic idea to compare snakes as long as they don't know you're doing it. So you're thinking about getting a snake and you've seen a ton of really cool ball pythons and you're starting to see the popularity of super dwarf and dwarf reticulated pythons. Both are awesome. But which one is better? Welcome to the Green Room, I'm Bob Bledsoe. This is Stella and this is Anya. I chose these two snakes for good reason. First of all, today is Stella's hatch day. She's two years old. And I chose Anya because she's a lovely snake, but she weighs almost exactly the same as Stella. You might recognize Anya as the young lady that Gray Family Snakes produced and sent to my brother Kent. Dang, that snake is huge! I mean, she's bigger than she was when you got her seven or eight months ago. You know, if you checked on her even once, you probably wouldn't be so surprised. She's getting to the size where she could cause some major damage to a population. A population of what? I should warn the neighbors. Maybe on your own time, Kent. You're still on the clock. Oh, right! Now I can't cover every single aspect of both these species, but I can cover everything that came to mind when I sat down to write this episode. How about that? Maybe not everything. My mind wanders and things get weird sometimes. Let's talk about size. Stella here is a 100% pure Kalatoa super dwarf reticulated python. At two years old, she weighs 671 grams and she's just shy of five feet long. Anya is a ball python. I bet you knew that. Uh, she's pastel azanthic hetferpied, in case you're wondering. She's about 10 months old, and she is four foot three. Well, that's obviously not true. She's just barely over three feet long. Past Bob's over there throwing out random lengths of other snakes. So Anya is three feet long, basically, and Stella is five feet long. Those are the lengths. And weighs 680 grams. That is nine little grams more than Stella. The thing is though, Stella will eventually be quite a bit bigger than Anya will ever be. Let's use my biggest adult female, Damara, as an example of the potential size that Anya could get to. Damara is about five and a half feet long and she weighs around 4,000 grams. That's almost nine pounds. Remember, Damara is not a three-year-old first-time breeder ball python. She's eight years old and she's large. Now the potential size of a dwarf or super dwarf reticulated python varies greatly. Like there's a really wide range of how big your snake can grow. But we're going to talk about a 100% Kalatoa super dwarf reticulated python, which is supposed to be pretty small as reticulated pythons go. Stella and my other super dwarf retic Echo might be seven feet and nine or 10 pounds during their first year of breeding. That might be a good size for them as four or five year old breeding females for the first time. But after a number of years, they could be 10 plus feet and 20 to 30 pounds. I can make that guess because my buddy Eric Lee has two adult super dwarf reticulated pythons, both 100% Kalatoa. One is eight years old and the other one is 10 years old. And they are just under and just over 10 feet long respectively. And they both weigh somewhere around 20 to 25 pounds. That's still way smaller than a mainland retic, which is great, but it's twice the size of a large adult ball python. Also, Joe at Reach Out Reptiles got back to me after I shot this to let me know that they have a few adults in that same age range that are between seven and eight feet long. So on the small end of potential size for super dwarf retics, between seven and 10 feet is a pretty wide range but dwarf and super dwarf retics get much bigger than that also, depending on their localities and percentages. So really big range of potential for your adult super dwarf or dwarf reticulated python. So think about your future self 10 years down the road, not four years or five years down the road, but 10 when your snake continues to grow. Is that a good size for you? I'm gonna put Stella on the tree. As you may have seen in a recent video, I don't usually mix species, my ball python with my reticulated python. It's probably okay, but I just generally don't do it. So managing them one in each hand is a little weird. Okay, Stella, good job. Get on that cliff. There we go. We might bring Echo out too. What do you think of that? What if we, uh, Echo's moving around. Hi, babes. Hi, do you want to come out too? I see you moving around. Let's talk about personality. I've heard a lot of people call ball pythons pet rocks, and I disagree. I give my ball pythons different enrichment items and different experiences, so they get used to things not being dangerous, and it makes a more curious snake and a more interactive snake. Now, they're still crepuscular, which means that they sleep most of the day, but when they're up, they're a lot more interactive than 
a pet rock. Almost any morning you can find me with a ball python around my neck as I make coffee, check on other snakes, shuffle around the early morning here in the green room. I can do that and use both my hands to do other things because the ball pythons will hang out on my neck. Sometimes they'll go to the top of my head. They don't slide off because I don't have any hair for them to slide on. But I can do that and still have hands free. They're a hands free snake. If I have Echo or Stella around my neck, I have to have one hand on them at all times because they are two crazy ladies who are always reaching for things, wrapping around my eyes, almost falling because they're always trying to reach the ceiling fan. I can't go hands free when I have them around my neck. Why did you bite me? That's not cool. Look, this is me. Crazy. You can hang out there, but don't bite your friends. Jeez. Echo. If you watch my videos, you've probably seen plenty of shenanigans from Echo and Stella. And that's one of my favorite things about Super Dwarf Reticulated Pythons is their personality and their shenanigans. But it might be too much for some people. Also, if you want to have a snake in your lap while you watch reruns of Golden Girls, that snake will not be a retic. But it might be a ball python. I have several that will sit in my lap occasionally. Not always, but sometimes. How do you feel about teeth in your skin? If that experience is an important factor to you, whether it's a no thank you or a yes please, I can tell you that a well socialized ball python is way less likely to bite you than a well socialized reticulated python. Now in both cases, it's going to be a food response bite because remember we're talking about well socialized snakes. But out of the 20 ball pythons that I have, not counting new babies, 0% of them bite me accidentally. That doesn't mean that you can't end up with a ball python that strikes at any heat signature, but it's pretty rare as ball pythons go. This is Echo, by the way, and Stella is up here, just in case you're wondering. And she just gave a great example of what I'm talking about here. The camera was off, but she bit me on the arm as she was coming out of her enclosure because she thought that I might be feeding, and I just backed up as she was coming out and she struck at the heat signature of my arm. Now, I was never too good at math in school, but let me see if I can figure out the percentage of retics who accidentally bite me. Out of the two retics that I have, 50% of them bite me on a regular basis. That's one out of two if we're looking at the stats here in the green room. Are you leaving? Are you heading up there? All right, see you later. I hope you feel bad for biting me, crazy lady. Hello, 911? No need for that, Kent. I'll probably be fine. Doubt it. Now it should be said that it's always my fault when I get bit. It's that Echo's in an ambush position and I've forgotten that she's sitting right there and I get too close. She's often in ambush and I can't be expected to remember all the time. But in this case, Echo was coming out of her cage and when she's coming out, she's kind of in food mode because she's not sure if I've opened the door to feed her or not. And in this case, sometimes I, I'll um, touch her with a hook and she's hook trained and I didn't do that in this case. So she kind of had to figure it out herself. And before she could figure it out, I was standing here and just got too close. I kind of backed up and, and I got my arm too close and she bit my arm. Not a big deal. I barely felt it and I can't even feel it right now. But you can bet that 10 years from now, I will be very well aware if Echo is somewhere in ambush position. It's gonna be a very different bite at that point. 10 years from now, you won't even be here because you're gonna be snake poop. You know why? I see where you're going with this. Because no need to explain. Echo's probably gonna eat you any day now. Snakes can eat things that are way bigger than their head and you are way bigger than her head so you qualify as her next meal. Are you done? Mm-hmm. Great, back to it. You know what, I'm snake free at this point. Hold on a second. This is Tiger Lily, a snake that would never bite me. But we're talking about bites and I wanna contrast Echo and Stella. So by contrast, Stella has never bitten me, never even tried to bite me. She sometimes will get into ambush position, but if I get too close to her, she is polite enough to tongue flick on me first, whereas Echo strikes first and asks questions later, which I think is probably more common for a reticulated python, whether it's a mainland, a dwarf, or a super dwarf, they just have a really strong food drive. I think I'm lucky that I have one that's like Stella. Retics are known to be food aggressive, and even with hook training and target training, which Echo is trained with both, she's still just doing her natural instinct. These are the natural behaviors that she would be doing in the wild. At least she doesn't hang on anymore. She used to hang on, now she lets go as soon as she realizes it's me. Because she's not trying to bite me, she's just striking at a heat signature. Here's a great example of going hands-free with a ball python. Let's see if I can do the mid-video handwritten Patreon scroll with a ball python around my neck 
without having to use another hand. These folks support the channel and get a whole bunch of perks. One of those perks is that the Patreon supporters are the ones who end up with baby snakes. There have been a number of people here in the horde of keepers who've gotten their first snake from me. And that's always fun to work with a snake and get them socialized and then send them off to somebody who's keeping a snake for the first time. And there's also some experienced keepers on this list who have gotten snakes from me. They know what they're doing, but I still socialize the snakes before they leave the green room. I think that's the thing with a green room python snake, right? Like you would expect it to be socialized or at least exposed to socialization. They also get extra videos, behind the scenes stuff. They get to learn about what's happening in the green room that I don't necessarily share on the channel. In fact, they've gotten a bunch of updates recently because I'm allowing one of my snakes to maternally incubate, and so they're seeing that process. I mean, you'll probably see that too, but they're getting to see it first, I guess. Here are the channel sponsors with the discount codes, Black Box Cages, Lane Labs for your frozen rodents, and Great Family Snakes, who produced Anya, and they produce really stunning animals, so go and give them a follow on Instagram. Look, I did the entire Patreon scroll with the snake on my neck. Now she moved from my neck to my shoulder, and now she's moving back onto my neck, but still, hands-free. How smart are these snakes? So I've talked about target training reticulated pythons, but you can also target train ball pythons. I have target trained a number of ball pythons. I don't really use it anymore because I use target training as a food cue and I don't have any ball pythons that really need that. So even though I don't use it, I have trained several of them uh, on a target. They quickly learn who their handler is. They get accustomed to new experiences if you work with them regularly. They quickly learn when feeding day is. If, you, if they can know what day of the week they're going to be fed, if you feed them on a regular schedule, that's pretty smart. Pretty smart animals. Retics are very smart. They are considered the second smartest snake in the world. I don't know how we sort of figure that out because we measure intelligence, I think, uh, differently than maybe we should. But everybody says that king cobras are the smartest snake in the world reticulated pythons being the second smartest. Uh, and yeah, that, that might track because retics are very easy to train for one thing, but they're also super interactive and they're curious about the person in the room. My retics are often coming up to me wondering what I'm up to, trying to see what I'm doing. They're always watching me in the room. When they come up to me, they don't want to hang out. They don't stay long, but they do want to check on me and see what's what, what I'm up to. They're probably checking to see if I might be feeding at that time. I think it's always related to food. Uh, that's just my assumption, who knows. But they're aware of everything in the room. And I don't see that behavior as much from ball pythons. Ball pythons are more uh, focused on what's immediately in front of them. So what are the main differences in keeping a ball python versus keeping retics? Well, for one thing, ball pythons occasionally will tend to go off food and that can be frustrating you won't get that problem from a retic. Some say that ball pythons are more prone to respiratory infection than retics, but I don't find ball pythons prone to respiratory infection. You know, an RI is caused by a virus that might be in the room, and if there's a virus in the room, any snake could get it, or it's caused by bacteria. Oh, come on, coffee maker. Or it's caused by bacteria in cages that aren't cleaned well. And if your cages are dirty, any snake could get an RI. So I don't know, maybe retics are more resistant to bacteria. I, I, I don't know. I wouldn't say that either snake has a problem with respiratory infection though. Reticulated pythons are going to require more space. Even if you have the smallest locality of super dwarf retic, it's going to eventually be much bigger than a ball python, so you need a bigger cage. And they're also more active than ball pythons, so they use a lot of space. I have my retics out of their cages almost every day. So basically they have their cage that is their den, but then this room is their cage that they roam around in. So with dwarf and super dwarf retics, everything is just ramped up intelligence, interactivity, size, likelihood of biting. So everything is just a bit extra with a retic. And for some keepers, you're not looking for extra when you're getting your first snake. And for others, that might be fantastic. So how long do they live? 20 plus years, sometimes over 30. Both species, there's not much of a difference in life span. But I'm mentioning it because I think it's great that you're looking to get your first snake and you're doing all this research because it's a big long-term commitment. So great job. You know, if you ever watch Clint's reptiles, he gives you all the awesome facts about the animals and then he gives you the ratings, which I find are spot on for the species that I know. But then he makes you decide for yourself which animal is right for you, which I just think is lazy on his part. Come on, dude, just tell me which animal I should get. But this is Green Room Pythons and I'm gonna tell you right now which snake you should get. 
a super dwarf reticulated python or a ball python based on everything we talked about. Actually, have you guys heard of hognose snakes? Because those little guys are so cute. We didn't even talk about those. What? Oh, we are out of time? Dang it. <laughs>